Hello, everyone, and welcome to Can Your Vendor Deliver on the Sassy Cloud Promise? Today's exciting webinar is sponsored by Netscope and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Mackenzie Puttisi with Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special presentation today about Sassy Clouds and what to consider. When selecting a SASE provider, it is essential to carefully evaluate three key elements of their infrastructure and network. First, what is the network of computing architecture? Second, who controls traffic flows? And third, is there real-time visibility of traffic and application performance? Without clear visibility into data flows, where processing takes place and routing decisions, vendors often struggle to deliver on the performance and reliability they promise. However, the shift to SASE does not have to be problematic. That is why the experts at Nextscope are here today to fill you in on best practices to make use of this technology. This is going to be such a cool conversation, and I can't wait to get started. So let's zip through the housekeeping and then get things on our way. First, I want to draw your attention to the questions section of your webinar console. This is the best place to get involved, get interactive, and post all your insightful questions, comments, feedback, and ideas. We indeed want to hear from you. So find that questions tab now, and let's start out by saying hi, hello, bonjour, hola, aloha or whatever greeting you'd like to leave today and give a wave to the community here with us. As a quick side note, that window is also the best place to reach out and let us know if you have any technical issues during the session. Knock on wood, of course, that you won't have any issues. And don't forget that a browser refresh should get rid of the usual tech gremlins. But if not, just shoot a message in the questions tab and the actual tech media crew and I will be here to help. And the last thing I want to point out on your audience console is the handouts tab just nested there among the questions. You will see that there is an awesome handout there from Netscope. It is a PDF, the network scorecard for the Netscope New Edge SASE Cloud. It has an attached report and is a resource you will certainly want to hold on to and review after today's webinar. And if all that cool content wasn't enough of a sweet giveaway, we also have a $250 Amazon gift card as a prize drawing at the end of the webinar. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize, and all winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. If you're not sure what those are, you can find the full T's and C's linked in the handouts tab as well. Okay, well, that's it for the housekeeping. I told you I would keep it short and sweet, and now we are ready to start our webinar. I am so excited to introduce you all to Joe Skorupa, the former Gartner Distinguished VP Analyst, and we also have Joe DiPaolo, Chief Platform Officer at Netscope. This is gonna be such a fantastic session with Joe and Joe. I don't get to say that often. These two are gonna walk you through what it takes to build a SASE cloud. So let's dive right into it and uh, kick it off, Joe and Joe. Joe, it's great to have a chance to catch up and to share some thoughts about what it takes to build a SASE cloud. In my view, when it's done right, a SASE cloud delivers highly available, reliable connectivity and secure access to applications, regardless of the location of the user, regardless of the location of the applications. I mean, whether they are cloud house hosted, a SaaS app, on-prem, or, or even way out at the edge. And I know today we're going to discuss the questions that networking and security professionals need to ask to determine if a particular provider can really deliver on the promise of a SASE cloud. But you know, before we do that, there may be some folks on the webinar that, that aren't familiar with you. So if you could take a minute and, and just give us a thumbnail of the things that you did before you joined Netscope to build this private dedicated SASE cloud. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, for me, this is kind of the culmination of my career. My background started in the mid '90s. Uh, I, I worked with for some of the first ever ISPs. Uh, I did the first ever web hosting. I, I turned up the first ever MPLS circuits, and so my early career was spent building carrier 
uh, in the early days of internet web hosting and data center based business. And then I switched and evolved into CDN, uh, where I built uh, one of the largest CDN providers in the world. And then public cloud, I, I built and led the infrastructure, of one of the largest public cloud providers. And now I find myself the chief platform officer of Netscope. And so what we build here and, and kind of my opinion on this whole topic around the SASE and the SASE architecture mm -hmm. uh, really feeds in with all that I've learned and all the deficiencies of the internet and public cloud and, um, and, and what, what, what the right way to do it is and what others are, are pretending to do. It sounds I mean, just it's an amazing, amazing background. And we have some interesting parallels across our careers that uh, that always make it fun. Um, why don't we get started and start talking about the, the topic here? And, you know, I realize some folks are going to think that the titles may be just a little bit cheeky. Um, but I think it's important because, in my view, the title really is that top level question that that really frames everything we're going to talk about today. For me, and I suspect with you, I've always thought about networking in the framework or through the lens of architecture. And that when you design a solution to a network problem, I mean, fundamentally, it's about matching the problem and the appropriate architect architecture to solve that problem, what it's doing you're trying to accomplish. When you're evaluating a vendor's offering, I think it's important to understand what was the architecture designed to do? You know, in the case of a SASE cloud, I think there's there's really only two choices uh, in terms of architecture. You know, you've either got a public cloud network, and that could either be the internet or it could be a hyperscaler's network, or you've got the choice of a dedicated private cloud. And for me, the thing that's important to recognize about a hyperscaler's cloud is it's heavily optimized for their business, whether it's selling stuff to you whether it's delivering email to your inbox or whether it's playing cute videos of dancing cats. For me, the other key element that's really important to understand is what's under the SASE vendor's control? What do they have control of regarding the network and what's beyond their control? Um, for example, if you're using a public cloud network, what are the chances that that public cloud vendor is ever going to give the SASE vendor control of that cloud network. Yeah. And my view, you know, you got you got two choices, two chances. You've either got slim or none, and it's heavily biased to none. Yeah. And that's where um, if you think about it, every other infrastructure uh, that relies on the internet focuses on two things, which is customer experience and what you touched on was control, right? And the ability to either influence the experience or tune or enhance. Uh, and for some reason, the SASE consumers uh, are not paying attention to the underlying infrastructure of SASE vendors. And so from our perspective, which I'm biased, but it was purpose built for this, uh, for a SASE type of solution. It, it focuses very, heav very heavily on user experience uh, and it focuses on the shortcomings of underlying infrastructure. And so if I were to double click a little bit on this and what you touched on with public cloud is, Public clouds are incredible, and they're designed uh, for a lot of use cases, and they're designed for um, uh, their own companies, right, to sell ads or shoes or cat videos or whatever. And then if for you to bolt on a security cloud on top of that, uh, it's suboptimal. It's, it's, and, then, and, and then to go a step further, what if there's congestion issues? Where are the servers? You know, who's doing the scaling? And so it is... It is something that is surprising as I spend more time with enterprise customers that they're not paying attention to what's under the covers of their SASE vendor and what that architecture really, uh, you know, really looks like. Yeah, you know, and, and it really doesn't surprise me, and I'll tell you why. Um, when I first heard about the Netscope SASE private cloud back when I was at Gartner, I got to admit, I didn't get it. You know, it just seemed so counterintuitive that a smaller vendor could build a better solution with appropriate reach and better performance. And so I started thinking about the public cloud providers and just off the top of my head, I started thinking about Google and they have global reach. They have an incredible backbone. They have as much bandwidth as you could ever imagine in your wildest dreams. 
So why wasn't it the answer? And then I took a look at a detailed diagram of their end-to-end architecture. And it's heavily optimized, as you said, for their use case. It's got dense, concentrated compute at the core. But it's designed for delivery. Right. And so it's got limited bandwidth and high latency connections for that delivery point. And you know what? It does a great job with search and streaming videos. But to my mind, doing high performance security processing, really in-depth security processing, you've got to have that dense high performance compute out at the edge, close to the user. And if you try to do a SASE cloud with a public cloud network, you've got to backhaul all of your security processing into the core of the network. And that gives you two problems. One of them is a performance issue, but the other one is constant. you're concentrating there. It's an issue about availability. And yeah, you can do things like you can set up a pseudo pop where you can terminate someone's connection so that if they do a ping, it looks like it's really short latency, but you're still backhauling all of that traffic. And you know, all and that does is try to mask, sorry? No, I say I was going to just I want to touch on that point right there. The problem there is that you're sharing all of those pipes with YouTube and with Gmail and so they're not they're not tuning, they're not steering for your the sassy vendor. And so yes, you're right, big uh, is good, but big isn't better. Big serves a different purpose. And so um, and it's very expensive to run in every region of a public cloud. So most providers only do it in some and so there's a lot of backhaul, there's a lot of congestion. And so it is a suboptimal infrastructure for edge-based, compute-based, low latency required applications. And that is what SASE uh, vendors are, you know, need to provide. Yeah, it doesn't matter how big it is if it's fundamentally the wrong architecture, That's right. which is what you're dealing with here. It's just the wrong way to do it. It's not bad. It's just meant to do something else. That's exactly right. And yeah, it's exactly. If I was starting a mobile web application or something today, I, it belongs there. And and we were very, from the very beginning, we were designed to run on an edge-based infrastructure. We interconnect with thousands of different ASs um, and the software and the product were designed from the ground up. So you have it built in the native environment, you have it built on edge-based infrastructure, and then you have the connectivity to, to, to hairpin, to do hot potato routing, to hold things closer, uh, which was the design of, of our platform and what should be the design of an edge-based SASE solution, which is uh, fairly, to me, it's fairly, op- fairly obvious, but yeah. most people aren't doing that way. They're just kind of glossing over. Well, you know, they designed, either they designed it to do something else or they're using somebody else's because they don't know how to do it themselves. That's right. And, you know, when I think about networking, you know, let me go back you know, what are my basic ideas about it? You know, there's only one reason to build a network. Right. And that's to provide high performance, highly available access to critical applications. And in this case, we're talking about enterprise applications. And to do that, you got to minimize the latency from the user to that security process. And some folks will say, well, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 milliseconds or 70 milliseconds. It's so small, I don't care. But Folks don't think about the fact that there are lots of apps and certainly legacy apps that may do 50 or 100 round trips just to paint everything on the screen. Yep. And, you know, that 70 milliseconds when you get 100 of them, really it up. gets pretty big pretty fast. Yeah. Um, the other thing about latency is it's not just about latency to the security processing. It's then about getting to the application provider. And so you want to be in an environment where you can minimize that end-to-end latency and still have good availability. And, you know, to do that, you've got to, as you said, you've got to control routing and peering, or you can't control latency. And you certainly can't do, you can't deal with data sovereignty unless you control routing, unless you know where your packets are going. That's right. You can't sign that attestation that you've got data sovereignty. So, yeah, let me, and when let me I think about let me jump Please. in here. This is a great point on, on the latency component is that security products inherently um, will add a latency tax. Um, but the mm-hmm. underlying part of it is, is the internet itself was not designed for high performance. It was designed for availability. Uh, ISPs have trouble with backhauling. There's no global carriers. And we've already discussed the, the, the cloud providers, which are used for a different purpose. And so 
not only will, will the solution that, that of an edge infrastructure provide low latency, but it also overcomes underlying infrastructure problems, fiber cuts, regional congestion. We make over 230 route changes proactively every month to avoid congestion and network events. And so you have the architecture, which you like to say, right, which mm -hmm. was designed to be close to the user, have rich connectivity, and then you have that ability to monitor performance. It really is the only way to then inject the security uh, solution without slowing down workflow. And if you have a if you have a performance problem, you have a security problem because users will turn off the agents, they'll use their own devices. And so again, yeah. the architecture of the SASE and the dependency on latency are two things the enterprise uh, is is undervaluing today, and it's very surprising to me. Yeah, again, you know, they think big must be better, they're successful. But you, know, you talk about the need to control routing and peering. You know, a hyperscaler is never going to turn over their routing to a SASE vendor that just happens to be piggybacking on that global cloud network. Yes. To do that would risk their core business, and it's just not going to happen. That's it. No question. No question. And then we, we, we like to talk about things and, and we, rec we recommend actually someone wrote a, a scorecard of questions you can ask, mm -hmm. which is fair, that you can ask your SASE vendor, where are the servers located? Right. A lot of mm -hmm. them, even if they have some edge servers, they were rely on a brain or backhaul. Right. So where are the servers? Where's the compute? Where's the processing? How is the routing decisions made? What's the scaling change management failover? These are all things, unfortunately, you need to ask because if every answer is, well, our vendor does it, then you're not buying from a SASE vendor, you're, bu you're buying from a reseller, right? And so uh, we, we like to provide that scorecard and have customers empowered to ask their SASE vendor some hard questions about that infrastructure because it will affect your ability to operate and your user's experience and, and ultimately translate into workflow and, and productivity issues. Yeah, and, and by the way, we've got a link to that report from Broadband Access that we'll have uh, on the webinar. Um, you know, again, I think it gets back to the fact that the only reason for a network is to deliver high-performance, scalable access to apps. And the thing that networking and security professionals really need to think about is when you deploy SASE, if it compromises on user experience, if it doesn't meet the needs of the business, it will fail and you will fail along with it and right. as you said end users will do anything to get their work done and if they have to find a way to bypass your SASE deployment they're going to do it and if there's enough of a problem business leaders are going to go to the tech department and say tear it down it's unusable it has to go away that's right now some vendors will say when they're questioned you know this is as good as it can be Look whose global cloud we're using. Yeah. What they really mean is this is the best that we can do with the wrong architecture. That's right. And those vendors can't switch now. They're public companies. They've made the investment. And so they're going to double down on a bad decision because they're financially committed. And, and so that, that's, that's, that's another. You have to look at the motivation there as well. So that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And the other part of high performance access is something you touched on, which is if you don't have real time data, on performance and availability, then you really can't troubleshoot a problem when it comes up. And when you've got a public cloud network, at best, because you're an overlay, you've got limited limited visibility into the network and you have no control. Yeah. I mean yeah, that's where a lot of the a lot of the enterprises are moving from on-prem devices, uh, maybe they're backhauling their users or users are concentrated into a central, and then they're moving to public cloud where, they, where they're going to lose visibility, they're going to lose troubleshooting, they're going to lose operational control. Whereas if the SASE vendor does have a dedicated infrastructure, it could actually be an extension. We have APIs, mm -hmm. we have uh, digital experience monitoring, uh, we have full controls that'll, that basically becomes an extension for that enterprise to give them the the, the kind of the equivalent of having an appliance uh, within the network. But if you're just if you're just defaulting to a public cloud, you're going to lose all that visibility and control, let alone all the architecture decisions we talked about. So, you know, it's, it's big and scary and sounds sounds like a lot of FUD, but you are going you are trusting a vendor that uh, is relying on somebody else. And it is um, it is something that's within your responsibility to, to investigate, from my opinion. Well, and in particular, that it's not that hard to do it right. It's just folks chose what they thought was the easy answer. But 
you know, again, when it's done right, you know, a SASE cloud will deliver that highly available, reliable, secure connectivity and secure access to apps regardless of where the user or apps are. The key that's thing right. is not all SASE clouds are created equal. Right. And that's right. just a matter of fact. And that really is what SASE is, right? It's the merging of network and security. And so you're not merging network. You're using somebody else's. That really isn't SASE. And every time I talk to a Gartner analyst or a customer, I, I make that point of you have to look at the network and the underlying yeah. platform as well as the security feature because it is the marriage of those two things, you know? And, you know, you were the, the founding father of SSE and, and this mm -hmm. stuff. And so you know firsthand for sure where uh, and how important these things are uh, as they integrate. Yeah, I mean, Neil McDonald and I had to write the research together for a reason. You know, this merger, this coming together required an understanding of both. And if you only control one and you can only have visibility and control into one, you can't deliver that end to end system. Um, you know, to me, there's three things that a SASE cloud vendor has to have. The first thing is you got to have the right architecture. If you got the wrong architecture, it doesn't matter. You need that low latency, high performance access and compute right there at the edge, close to where the users are. The second thing is, as you said, you've got to have control over traffic flows. If you can't control peering and routing, you can't guarantee latency, you can't manage performance, and you can't do data sovereignty. And the whole thing that wraps around it is you've got to have that visibility end-to-end -end, you know, in terms of performance and availability. And most folks will say, well, okay, it's about outages. In some way, outages are easy. You've got yeah, a hard yeah. failure. The tough ones are those crazy intermittent transient things that come and go that just, they wreak havoc on user experience. Right. And if you're one layer or two layers removed from the person running the network, you're never going to see what's going on there. It what makes that troubleshooting impossible. What if your vendor's using um, a, a GCP platform and that you have users in China, right? There's no Google yeah. platform in China. What if you're in the the Western countries of South America? What if you're in Af certain parts of Africa? And so there are plenty of users that where there are not cloud infrastructure. And so, I mean, you, you definitely um, have summed it up there pretty good. Are there any kind of takeaways for you or things that you think about? I know I have some thoughts, but you know, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are as we wrap this up. Yeah, I think you know, when you're gonna do this, do the hard work. Too much is at stake. So you really have to go in and examine what the vendor's doing, not just what do they say, but what's really there, because that's the only way to get it right. And in the end, architecture is critical. Yeah. And not all vendors have the vision or do they have the technical expertise to build and operate the right solution? They don't have folks on their team with your background because they've outsourced it. Right. So, you know, before you select that SASE cloud vendor, do the hard work. There's too much at stake to just believe someone's claim. And as you said, the broadband testing report, a network scorecard for evaluating SASE clouds, they do a great job point by point walking you through it, helping you ask the tough questions, gather the data you need, being able to evaluate it so you get the right solution. Yeah, that's fantastic. And from, from my perspective, uh, as a as a consumer of of technology and and networks for a lot of years, it's always good to do a POC, right? Because a yeah. lot of vendors claim a lot of things, and it is confusing about Google and Amazon and other things. And so, run a POC. Look at your users from all different perspectives. Look at different applications, right? You're using GCP, uh, a vendor using GCP, but your applications are on Microsoft. What does that mean? And like you, like I talked about China. And so, the only yeah. other thing, the scorecards, a great point. And then don't be afraid to run that POC and ask them some hard questions because that really is the best way to see how it's going to impact you and uh, everybody's going to say they're the fastest. And so uh, test it out for yourself. Yeah, POCs, it's interesting. When I, just as I was leaving Gartner, we saw a big shift from people doing a paper analysis to doing a POC. And one of the great things about SASE is because so much of the value is cloud and network delivered. It's so much easier to do a POC. There's no excuse. Uh, in, in the olden days of boxes, to do a POC meant shipping oh, stuff yeah. to the world. Figuring it. Having to install it and turning it up. 
and you know, getting the vendor to loan you the gear and the evaluation gear is not available till next month and you don't have SEs to stand it up, there's no excuse to not do a POC. And that's just a great guidance. Do that work and it dramatically increases your chance of a successful deployment. Well, this has been great, Joe. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's, you're it's always fun to get together with you and chat and especially on something that's near and dear to both of us like this. Yes, sir. Well, you're a legend. Thanks a bunch. And, uh, you know, uh, if you, you if anybody has any questions, click on the links, uh, reach out to Netscope and uh, and thanks everybody for the time. Uh, well, let's do this again soon. And again, thanks everyone for the time. Awesome. Thank you so much, you two. For those of you who have been actively asking questions out there in the audience, you are awesome. Thank you for doing that. Uh, but we are not going to have time for a live Q&A with Joe and Joe today. They're taking off and uh, we're just going to collect these questions and make sure you get a follow up from the Netscope team. So thank you for that. I know it's a bit short and it's a bit sweet, uh, but you can definitely follow up. Uh, by going into the handouts tab there, grabbing the handout network scorecard for the Netscope new Edge Sassy Cloud. And of course, as mentioned uh, by Joe DiPaolo, you can always reach out directly to Netscope and get started if you're curious to do so. So let's wrap things up with an exciting prize. I know you've all been here, you've been waiting, you've been patient. Uh, it's a short and sweet kind of day. So let's hopefully sweeten things up for at least one of you out there in the audience. And one quick reminder, you do need to be live and present here at the webinar to qualify to win. So hope your ears are perked up and you're about to hear your name. This $250 Amazon gift card is going out to David Keitel from California. Congratulations to you, David. As always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after today's webinar. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank Netscope for making this webinar possible. And I especially want to give our incredible speakers, uh, Joe One and Joe Two, if I'm allowed to say that, who have given us so much to think about today. And hey, sending high fives and special thanks to all of you out there in the audience for making today possible as well. I know sometimes it can be difficult to stop our daily grind and take a moment to strategize and plan ahead. So whether you're just learning about Sassy now, you're deep into Sassy clouds, or you know this is something on your long-term horizon, I hope you've learned something today and you're gonna take away you know, what you should be looking at with Sassy Clouds, what to watch out for in setting one up with a vendor and hopefully being able to vet a vendor a little bit better. I know I've learned a ton from today's session and I hope you all have as well. I cannot wait to see you all at another webinar again soon. And until then, have an absolutely magical day. Take care, everyone.